Hello and welcome to the Figure Preparation and Image Editing Workshop. I'm Curtis Glavin from the Pediatric Oncology Department at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. This is the first of three sessions on figure preparation and image editing for grant applications and journal publications. This session will be covering concepts and tools related to image editing. In the next session, we'll cover common workflows. And in the third and final session, we'll be covering advanced image editing techniques. It is important to note that these sessions are designed to provide information about image editing for grant applications, digital presentations, and journal publications. These sessions are not intended to cover techniques and tools that should be used when processing images for scientific analysis. However, many of the concepts and tools covered in this workshop are relevant to image processing for analysis and should serve as a good introduction for those looking to do more advanced image analysis work. In the electromagnetic spectrum, a narrow band of wavelengths are visible to the human eye. These wavelengths are called the visible light spectrum. Light visible to the human eye ranges in wavelength from approximately 390 nanometers to 700 nanometers. The human eye interprets light in these wavelengths as approximately 10 million distinguishable colors. Let's imagine that we have a simple scene with a light source, an object, and a viewer. The light source in the scene will emit photons, which will move across space and interact with objects in the scene. If an object is visible to the viewer, some of these photons will bounce off the object and be reflected into the viewer's eye. Now let's look at the scene again in a little more detail. Imagine that the object that is being viewed in the scene is a red box. Typically, a light source like the sun or a light bulb will emit light at multiple wavelengths. This light will travel through space and interact with objects in the scene. In this case, since the box is red, the box will absorb light that would appear blue or green. Light at wavelengths that appear red will be reflected by the box into the viewer's eye. This is called a subtractive color model. Laser printers use this type of color model to render colors on a printed page. Typically, a white page of paper is loaded into a laser printer. The white color of the paper will be the brightest shade of white visible in any image printed on the paper. When the paper passes through the printer, the printer will apply toner to the paper to create different colors. The printer will use combinations of cyan, magenta, yellow, and black toner to create images on the paper. In this figure, these different toner colors are represented by C, M, Y, and K, respectively. If the printer mixes equal parts cyan and yellow, it will generate green. If the printer mixes equal parts magenta and yellow, it will generate red. If equal parts cyan, magenta, and yellow are mixed, black will be generated. However, because black is so commonly used in printing, for example in printing text, and because it is expensive and complicated to mix cyan, magenta, and yellow toner to generate black, laser printers typically have a separate black cartridge, which is referred to as K. Computer monitors work differently. Imagine that we have a computer monitor. On the monitor, we display an image of the Mona Lisa painting. If we were to look closely at the monitor, perhaps through a magnifying glass, we would see that the Mona Lisa image is rendered as a two-dimensional grid of single color squares. Each of these squares is referred to as a picture element or pixel. This pixel, which has a yellowish color, is actually made up of several component colors. If we were to look even closer at the pixel on the monitor, perhaps with an even more powerful magnifying glass, we would see that this pixel is actually a combination of three lights in the colors red, green, and blue. Most computer monitors use combinations of red, green, and blue lights to generate colors. 
The red, green, and blue lights for each pixel are brightened or dimmed in various combinations to create different colors. For example, on a good computer monitor, this pixel's color would be generated by setting the red light for the pixel to be 94% of its maximum intensity. The green light for this pixel would be set to 67% of its maximum intensity, and the blue light would be set to 24% of its maximum intensity. This is an additive color model. Computer monitors use this type of color model to render colors on screen. In an additive color model, we start with the absence of light, which is black. Red, green, and blue lights are added in combination to create multiple colors. For example, combining red and green in equal intensities will yield yellow. By combining maximum intensities of all three colors, red, green, and blue, white is created. So we have examples of two different color models, CMYK and RGB. CMYK is a subtractive color model. RGB is an additive color model. Devices like laser printers use a CMYK color model. Computer monitors typically use an RGB color model. In storing digital images, another factor to consider is bit depth. The individual components of a color in a particular color model are known as channels. In RGB color, for example, red, green, and blue are the channels. Red is a channel, green is a channel, and blue is a channel. In the CMYK color model, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black are the channels. Cyan is a channel, magenta is a channel, yellow is a channel, and black is a channel. As you may know, computers typically store data in ones and zeros. These are known as bits. The intensity of each channel in a color is stored in bits in the computer. Using more bits to store a single intensity value increases the number of possible intensity values. Imagine having a small set of colored pencils, which is similar to a computer storing color intensities using low bit depth versus having many different colored pencils, which is similar to a computer being able to store lots of color intensities using high bit depth. Let's look at an example. Assume that we are storing red intensity values with two bits. Given that each bit has one of two possible values, either 0 or 1, and that we are using two bits, we would have 2 squared, which is four possible intensity values for red. So two bit depth color would allow us to store one of four possible intensity values for each channel, in this case, four intensity values for red. Three bit per channel color would allow us to represent two cubed intensity values, which comes out to eight different intensity values. In this case, three bits per channel would allow us to store one of eight different intensity values for red. If we compare the various intensity values of red that can be represented with two bits in the upper example to the number of intensity values of red that can be represented with three bits in the lower example, we see that the leftmost, no red, and rightmost, 100% red, intensity values at each bit depth are the same. However, the intermediate intensities of red in the top row don't perfectly match any of the intensity values of red in 3 bit per channel color in the lower row. It's important to note that even if you are converting digital image data from a low bit depth to a higher bit depth, as in this example, it may not be possible to store the exact intensity value from a lower bit depth in a higher bit depth. Referring back to our colored pencil example, it is possible to have a set of eight colored pencils in various shades of red, but only have two of these pencils match pencils in a smaller, separate set of four colored pencils. In RGB, 8 bits per channel would yield 256 possible intensity values per channel for red, 256 possible intensities for green, 
and 256 possible intensities for blue. Calculating the total number of colors that can be represented in 8-bit RGB, 256 cubed would yield approximately 16.7 million colors. Many computer images and computer displays use 8 bits per channel for RGB to represent colors. Consider for a moment why this number of bits per channel is useful. Earlier in the session, we discussed that the human brain is able to distinguish approximately 10 million unique colors. Therefore, this 16.7 million color figure that is possible with 8 bit per channel RGB is important because in theory it represents more colors than are visible to the human eye. 7 bit per channel RGB, for example, would be able to represent approximately 2 million different colors, which would be fewer than the number of unique colors visible to the human eye. Even though there are limitations to what human beings are able to see, it is important to note that some sensitive instruments can capture more than 256 intensities per color channel, and this sensitivity can be important in performing computer analysis of images. Advanced scanners and microscope cameras can often capture more than 256 intensities per channel. So it's important to remember that reducing bit depth can change the colors in an image. Additionally, in some cases, increasing bit depth can also change colors in an image. Especially for images that are going to be used for scientific analysis, it is critical to retain the appropriate bit depth for images that are captured by acquisition instruments, such as microscope cameras. A color space is a particular set of colors. For digital image data, color space is often determined in part by bit depth and color model. It is important to note that colors in one color space may not perfectly match colors in another color space. In addition to color variations when comparing color spaces, colors displayed on a standard computer monitor can vary depending upon the angle at which the screen is viewed. In this example, the same screen displaying the same test pattern is viewed from two different angles. The top image shows the screen viewed directly. The bottom image shows the same screen viewed from below at an angle. Comparing the colors between the two images, starting from the color square at the top left of the test pattern and moving towards the right, we can see that the 8th, 9th, and 10th color squares in the top row vary in color significantly between the top and bottom images. In the top image, these three squares have easily distinguishable different shades of turquoise, blue, and purple. In the lower image, when the screen is viewed at an angle, these squares all look very similar. While this is an unscientific study, if we were to measure the average color of the ninth square in the top image, we would find that the average color across the square in the image is composed of 24% of the maximum intensity of red, 63% of the maximum intensity of green, and 93% of the maximum intensity of blue. The same square in the bottom image has an average pixel color of 44% of the maximum intensity of red, 55% of the maximum intensity of green, and 100% of the maximum intensity of blue. While color accuracy and viewing angle variations differ, from one computer display to the next, if you have a computer display in front of you, you can try to see this phenomenon by looking at the same colors from different angles by tilting your monitor or moving your head. Changing viewing angle may shift some colors more than others. And so, colors can vary on a single display. Given this understanding, how do we work around limitations in the color accuracy of computer displays and manage colors in different color spaces? First, it's important to proof or validate RGB colors on color accurate displays. Additionally, it is also important to know the color space limitations of the media you're working with. Keep in mind that colors on computer monitors will often appear different than colors on printed media. Now that we've discussed color, it's important to discuss 
different digital image formats. This is a picture of one of the most famous paintings in the world, Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa. There is only one of the most famous version of this painting. It has a specific size and it's located in the Louvre in Paris. Here is a different work of art named Wall Drawing 51 by the artist Sol Lewitt. This particular piece is the instructions, take a wall and connect every architectural point on the wall with every other architectural point on the wall using straight lines. This piece is currently installed in the Mass Mocha Museum in North Adams, Massachusetts, but it has also been installed in many other galleries around the world. These two different pieces of art are somewhat analogous to two different digital image formats. The Mona Lisa is like the bitmap image format on computers. Bitmaps are stored as fixed two-dimensional grids of pixels. Bitmaps are typically generated from real-world data captured by scanners or digital cameras. Changing bitmap pixel data is sometimes called painting pixels. Wall Drawing 51 is analogous to the vector image format. Vector images, or vector graphics, describe shapes and geometry in a computer. Vector graphics are typically computer generated. Generating or manipulating vector graphic images is typically referred to as drawing vectors. A common example of a vector graphic format would be a font. A computer will typically have many different fonts installed, and these fonts tell the computer how to render a particular character, for example the letter A, at a certain point size in a certain style, for example in Helvetica or Times New Roman. The font file itself is a collection of vector images that describe the shape of each character of the alphabet in a particular style. In general, in preparing figures and presentations, it is ideal to preserve vector image data in vector format while keeping bitmap image data in bitmap format. In storing bitmap images, it is important to consider compression. Because bitmap images are made up of many pixels, each of which has a unique color value, bitmap images can occupy a lot of space when they are stored on the computer. Different compression techniques can be used to reduce the file size of bitmap images on the computer. For example, imagine that we have this simple bitmap image made up of 24 pixels. The bitmap is 8 pixels wide by 3 pixels tall. If we look at this simple bitmap image, we can notice that starting from the upper left pixel and proceeding horizontally to the right along the top row of pixels, the first four pixels are all exactly the same color of red. Similarly, looking at the bottom row of pixels, we can notice that the fourth through eighth pixels in the row are all the same color of red. Instead of storing the color values for every individual pixel in the image, we could store this bitmap image by storing the width and height dimensions of the image in pixels, and after storing the color of the first pixel, starting with the upper left pixel and moving to the right, we could simply store that the next three pixels are the same color without having to save the color value again for each of those consecutive pixels. Once we reached the fifth pixel in the row, which has a novel color, we could store the new color for this pixel. Similarly, in the bottom row, once we reached the fourth pixel in the row, we could store that pixel's color and then store that the remaining pixels in the image are all the same color. This way, we would not have to repetitively store the same color values for adjacent pixels that have the same color. This would allow us to reduce the size of the bitmap image without changing the colors of the pixels in the image. This technique is called run length encoding. It is a form of lossless compression which allows us to reduce the size of a bitmap image file that has adjacent pixels with the same color without compromising the fidelity of the image data. Another strategy for reducing the size of this image if it were an 8 bit per channel RGB color space would be, for example, to notice that all of the pixels in the image are shades of red and do not have green or blue components. 
Therefore, we would not have to store green or blue values for the pixels in the image. This would be another form of lossless compression for this particular image. Let's consider a different example of image compression. Imagine that we have this 8x3 pixel bitmap image. Starting from the top left pixel, we could notice that the first four pixels of the top row are the same color, and the following two pixels, while not exactly the same color, are close in color. We could similarly notice that starting from the leftmost pixel of the second row and moving to the right, the second through fifth pixels of that row have colors that are similar to the color of the first pixel in the row. And finally, the second and third pixels of the bottom row are also similar, though not identical in color, to the leftmost pixel on the bottom row. To greatly reduce the size of this bitmap image file, we could remove the pixels in each row that have a different but similar color when compared to the color of the first pixel in each row. We could then replace these pixels with pixels that are exactly the same color as the first pixel in each row. This would create a new bitmap image with pixels of slightly different colors than the original image. If we then used run length encoding to reduce the size of this bitmap file, we could greatly reduce the file size of the image when compared to the file size of the original image. Notice, however, that in doing this, we have changed the original bitmap image data to greatly reduce the file size. Some of the pixel colors in our new image do not perfectly match the colors of the corresponding pixels in the original image. This sort of technique is called lossy compression. Lossy compression changes bitmap image data in an irreversible way to greatly reduce the file size of a bitmap image. The term lossy indicates that some of the original image data is lost in the compression process. For images that will be used for scientific analysis, it is important to avoid lossy compression as this distorts image data. We have looked at two different types of image compression. Lossy compression distorts image data to reduce file size. Lossless compression reduces file size by more efficiently storing image data, but does not distort image data. Destructive editing is manipulation or editing of an image in a way that destroys or distorts image data. An example of destructive editing would be taking an uncompressed image and compressing it using lossy compression. Non-destructive editing is manipulation or editing of image data in such a way that the image data is not distorted. An example of non-destructive editing would be compressing an uncompressed image file with lossless compression. Let's look at some popular types of bitmap files. Some examples of lossless bitmap file types are BMP, which is the Windows bitmap file type, PNG, which is the Portable Network Graphics file type, and sometimes TIFF. BMP files store all color data for all pixels in a bitmap image. BMP files do not compress image data. PNG uses lossless compression to reduce file size, but does not distort image data. TIFF can store lossless data in a number of different ways, either using uncompressed image data or using lossless compression. TIFF is also able to store bitmap data at higher bit depths than BMP or PNG, which can make it a good file type for storing image data acquired from sensitive instruments like microscopes. However, it is important to note that TIFF can also distort image data by using lossy compression, as we will see in a moment. Some examples of lossy bitmap file types are JPEG, which is a popular image file type that intentionally reduces image quality and distorts image data in order to greatly reduce bitmap image file size. And as mentioned, TIFFs can also use lossy compression to store bitmap images. In manipulating images for science, whether it's for analysis or publication, Lossy file types and lossy compression should never be used. Preserving color information by using file types that can preserve the full bit depth data 
from the original image data is also important. In general, while all of the file types above are common, for bitmap images, researchers will want to use TIFFs with lossless compression for high bit depth images and PNG for 8-bit RGB images. Finally, let's look at some container file types. Container files can store both vector and bitmap image data. Some examples of container file types are PDF, the portable document format, XPS, which is Microsoft's fixed layout file type that is an alternative to PDF, EPS, which is the encapsulated postscript file type, SVG, which is the scalable vector graphics file type, ODG, which is the Open Office Draw graphics file type, and AI, which is the Adobe Illustrator graphics file type. Although there are many cases where the above file types can and should be used, the most common container file formats most researchers will want to use are PDF and SVG, especially when exchanging image data with colleagues, as these file types are widely supported. Now that we've gone through some concepts, let's look at some software tools that can be used to generate and edit image files. Please follow along on your own computer as we explore these software tools. If you haven't already done so, you can download and install the software we will be using for the rest of this session for OS X, Windows, or Linux. We will be using the GNU Image Manipulation Program, which can be downloaded from www gimp.org. We will also be using OpenOffice Draw, which is part of the OpenOffice suite of programs that can be downloaded from www.openoffice.org. So here we are in the GNU Image Manipulation Program, which is known as GIMP. For this workshop, we will be using GIMP version 2.8.10. GIMP is updated frequently, so there may be a newer version available now. In that case, please run the latest version of the software available. It should still be possible to follow along, as most of the tools and concepts that will be covered are consistent across versions of the software. After starting GIMP for the first time, the program will take a while to load, as it will index all of the font files on your computer. Once GIMP has finished loading, there may be many different windows for the program open on screen. While having multiple windows can be very helpful, for example, when working with multiple monitors. To simplify things for this workshop, we'll consolidate everything into a single window. To do this, on Microsoft Windows, click the Windows menu in the center GNU Image Manipulation Program window. On an OS X machine, please make sure one of the GIMP windows is active by clicking on its title bar, then click on the Windows menu at the top of the screen. Select Single Window Mode from the Windows menu to consolidate everything into a single window. The new Single GIMP window may need to be dragged to be centered on screen, and should look like this. There are groups of icons on the left and right side of the screen, with a large open workspace area in the center of the screen. These groups are called dialogues. The dialogues can be grouped together. These larger groupings are called docs, and when multiple dialogues are grouped together in a dock, each individual dialogue may also be referred to as a tab. On the left side of the window, this collection of tools is called the toolbox. Each of these icons in the toolbox represents a different tool that can be used in image editing, and at the bottom of the toolbox there are two overlapping color swatches. These swatches represent the foreground and background colors. Some tools use these foreground and background colors when painting pixels. Below the toolbox and swatches is the Tool Options dialog. With the Airbrush tool selected as it is now, there are various options for the Airbrush tool displayed. Click the Bucket Fill tool in the toolbox and notice that the Tool Options dialog changes to present the options for the currently selected Bucket Fill tool. On the right side of the window, there are various dialogues that are docked together and are visible as tabs. Clicking on these tabs selects the corresponding dialog. 
we'll explore dialogues and tools more as we proceed through the workshop. Let's create a new image, paint some pixels in the image, examine the pixel structure of the image we create, then save this image in different file types to explore differences between file types. We'll get started by creating a new image. First, click the File menu, then click New. Under Image Size, next to Width and Height, the width and height dimensions of the image that will be created are displayed. Click the pull-down menu to the right of these numbers and select Pixels to display the image dimensions in pixel units. Click the pull-down menu next to Template and select 800 by 600. The image size should now be set to 800 pixels wide by 600 pixels tall. Click the plus or arrow to the left of Advanced Options to expand the Create a New Image window. Note that the color space is set to RGB color. Click the pull-down menu next to Fill With and select White. Click the OK button to create an 800 pixels wide by 600 pixels tall image in RGB color space with a white background. An 800 pixels wide by 600 pixels tall white image should appear in the center of the GIMP workspace. The total pixel area of an image is known as the canvas. Currently, the entire canvas of this new image is filled with white pixels. The gray areas that you may see in the workspace around the image are part of the GIMP window and are not part of the image. These areas are outside of the image canvas. Let's change the color of all of the pixels in the image to green. To do this, first let's set the foreground color to green. At the bottom of the toolbox dialog, double-click the top left swatch to change the foreground color. The Change Foreground Color window should appear. Note that in the middle of the Change Foreground Color window, RGB color values for the foreground color are shown. Since we want to set the foreground color to green, we'll want to change G to its maximum value, which is 255. To the right of G, click and hold the triangle handles and drag the slider all the way to the right. The numeric field to the right of the slider should increase to 255. Release the mouse button. This sets the green component of the foreground color to its maximum intensity value. If the numeric value to the right of R is not zero, Click and drag the triangles in the R slider all the way to the left to set the red intensity to zero, then release the mouse button. It is also possible to change the RGB values numerically. Double click the numeric value to the right of the B slider and using the keyboard enter zero, then press return. Note that in the lower left corner of the change foreground color window, swatches displaying the current and old color are displayed. Experiment with generating different colors by manipulating the R, G, and V values. Then set these values to 0, 255, and 0 respectively, and click on the OK button to set the foreground color to green. The foreground color swatch at the bottom of the toolbox should be set to green. Make sure that the bucket fill tool is still selected in the toolbox. If it is not, click on its icon to select it. Move the mouse cursor over the image canvas in the workspace. Note that the image cursor displays a paint bucket icon, indicating that the bucket fill tool is active. With the mouse over the white image canvas, single click the mouse to change all the white pixels to green. The bucket fill tool paints areas of contiguous, similarly colored pixels with a specific color. Because all of the pixels in the image were the same color, the Bucket Fill tool painted all the pixels in the image green. Let's use the Bucket Fill tool to paint two circles. We'll make the first circle black. 
Notice that to the lower left of the foreground and background swatches at the bottom of the toolbox, there is a pair of black and white squares. Click on these squares to set the foreground color to black and the background color to white. We could have changed the foreground color to black by double clicking on the foreground swatch and adjusting the RGB values for the foreground color as we did when setting the foreground color to green, but because black and white are so frequently used, GIMP provides this helpful shortcut to set the foreground and background values to black and white. Now, if we apply the bucket fill tool to the image again, it would simply paint all the pixels in the image black, which is not what we want. To paint a black circle, we'll first select the area of the image we want to paint. In the toolbox, click the Ellipse Select tool. In the Tool Options dialog, ensure that the leftmost icon next to Mode is selected. If it isn't, click it. Also make sure that anti-aliasing is unchecked, that the pull-down menu next to Fixed is set to Aspect Ratio, and the text field below is set to 1 to 1, and that the other options are as configured here. Move the mouse over the image and notice that the mouse cursor changes to a cross with a broken circle to its lower right, indicating that the Ellipse Select tool is active. With the mouse cursor over the image, click and drag with the mouse and continue holding down the mouse button. Notice that an ellipse inside a rectangle appears over the image. Continue dragging with the mouse button held down and notice that the dimensions of the ellipse and rectangle change. Many tools in GIMP work with modifier keys. When a tool is in use and a modifier key is pressed, the modifier key will alter the way the tool operates. While still holding down the mouse button, hold down the shift key on the keyboard, then continue holding down the mouse button and drag the mouse. Notice that the ellipse and rectangle over the image are constrained to a circle and square. The shift key is a modifier key that enables fixed mode for the ellipse select tool. In the tool options dialog, the fixed option becomes checked when the shift key is held while the ellipse select tool is active. Drag with the mouse with the shift key still held down to make a selection circle that is about one-sixth the size of the image. Release the mouse button, then release the shift key. The selection area appears as a flashing broken circle. While the ellipse select tool is still active, the selection area is outlined in a square, indicating that the selection area can be modified. Move the mouse cursor over the selection area. When the mouse cursor is moved inside the square around the selection area and is near the edges or corners of the square, the mouse cursor changes and small rectangular handles appear inside the square. Move the mouse cursor to one of the corners of the square and click and drag the mouse. It's possible to resize the selection circle by dragging the mouse, and it's possible to fix the aspect ratio of the circle by holding down the shift key while dragging the mouse. Resize the selection circle to be a little larger, then release the mouse button and release the shift key. Move the mouse cursor to the center of the selection circle. The cursor changes to a four-way directional arrow. Click and drag with the mouse to move the selection area. Move the selection circle towards the left edge of the image and release the mouse button to set the selection area's position. Now that we have created a circular selection area, let's paint the pixels in the selected area black. Click the Bucket Fill tool in the toolbox. Move the mouse cursor over the image. Notice that when the cursor is outside the selection circle, a strikethrough symbol appears to the upper right of the mouse cursor, indicating that the Bucket Fill tool cannot paint pixels outside of the selection area. Single-click outside the selection area and notice that no pixels are painted. Move the mouse cursor inside the selection area, then click with the mouse to paint the selected pixels black. The selected circular area of pixels is painted black.
go to the Select menu and click None to deselect everything. Now let's paint a white circle. Notice that at the bottom of the toolbox, the background swatch is set to white. Since we want the foreground color to be white, we can swap the foreground and background colors by simply clicking the double arrow to the upper right of the foreground and background color swatches. Click the double arrow and notice that the foreground color is now white. Click on the Ellipse Select tool in the toolbox. In the Tool Options dialog, check Anti-Aliasing. Move the mouse cursor over the image canvas and click and drag to create a circular selection area near the black circle. Hold the Shift key while dragging to enable Fixed Mode for the Ellipse Select tool. Then release the mouse button to draw a circular selection area similar in size to the black circle. After the circular selection area is created, edit the new selection area as before by moving or resizing the selection area as necessary. The new selection area should be similar in size and close to the black circle. Click the Bucket Fill tool in the toolbox. With the foreground color set to white, single click inside the selection area to paint the selected pixels white. Go to the Select menu and click None to deselect everything. We now have an image with a green background and black and white circles. To examine the pixel structure of the image closely, it helps to zoom in on areas of the image. We can use the navigation dialog to do this. Click the small left arrow icon in the upper right corner of the GIMP window and select Add Tab, then click Navigation to add the Navigation tab to the collection of dialogs in the dock. In the Navigation dialog that appears, we can see a thumbnail of the entire image we created. To zoom in on the image, click the icon with a plus sign inside a magnifying glass toward the bottom left of the Navigation icon. To zoom in on the image, Click the icon with a plus sign inside a magnifying glass towards the bottom left of the navigation dialog. Click the zoom in icon repeatedly until the view is zoomed to approximately 1000% as indicated by the number on the lower right side of the navigation dialog. Over the thumbnail in the navigation dialog, a rectangle highlights the area visible in the main GIMP workspace. The areas of the image not visible in the workspace are darkened in the thumbnail. Move the mouse cursor over the highlighted area in the navigation dialog and click and drag the mouse to pan around the image. Pan to an area where both painted black pixels and white pixels are visible and release the mouse button. Here we can see that the edge of the painted pixel area is made of many square pixels, each of a single color. Notice that along the edge of the black circle, pixels are either completely black or completely green, and the curved edge of the circle appears as a series of blocky, distinct steps of pixels. In contrast, notice that there is a gradual transition in color from areas that are completely white to areas that are completely green along the edge of the white circle. This gradual transition is called anti-aliasing. Anti-aliasing smooths transitions between colors. This can be helpful, for example, when painting curved shapes. Because shapes made of pixels are necessarily composed of small squares, anti-aliasing can make curved shapes appear smoother. Using pixels to paint curves without anti-aliasing can produce jagged edges as visible around the black circle. This is known as aliasing. In the navigation dialog, click the magnifying glass icon with 1 colon 1 inside it to zoom out so that each pixel in the image is perfectly aligned to a single pixel on the computer monitor. Let's save all of the image data we just created. To do this, go to the File menu, then go to Save As. 
Select a location to save the image and enter the image name xcfversion.xcf. Note that the name should end with an XCF extension. XCF is the native file type for the GNU image manipulation program, and it will preserve all of the image data we created. Click Save to save the image. Now let's export this image to multiple file types and compare the files. First, we'll save the image as a losslessly compressed TIFF image, which should preserve the pixel data we created. Go to the File menu and select Export As. Click the plus or arrow to the left of Select File Type by Extension. Scroll down and select TIFF Image. Select a location to save the image, and in the Name field enter tiffversion.tif. Then click the Export button. The Export Image as TIFF window appears. There are various options for compression. None will store all the pixel data without compression. LZW, Pack Bits, and Deflate will use lossless compression to save file size without distorting pixel data and JPEG will use lossy compression to reduce both file size and image quality. Select LZW and click the Export button. In general, when saving to TIFF, LZW is a good compression scheme to use as it is widely supported, reduces file size, but does not compromise image quality. It is important to avoid JPEG compression in TIFF since it can reduce image quality. To export to a different file format, click the File menu, then click Export As. Select a location to save the file and in the Name field enter pngversion.png. GIMP will know to use the PNG file type for export since we have appended the .png extension at the end of the file name. Click the Export button. In the Export as PNG window that appears, make sure that the compression level is set all the way to 9, which is the maximum compression level. Then click the Export button. To save in one last format, Click the File menu, then again click Export As. In the Export Image window that appears, select a location to save the file, then in the File Name field enter jpegversion.jpg. Click the Export button. In the Export as JPEG window that appears, click the plus or arrow to the left of Advanced Options. Click and drag the quality slider at the top of the window all the way to the left to set the quality to zero. Under Subsampling, click the pull-down menu and select 4 colon 2 colon 0 chroma quartered. Under DCT method, click the pull-down menu and select Fast Integer. The options we have selected here will greatly reduce the quality of the JPEG image we are about to create. Typically, we would never want to use these options because they would reduce the image quality so much. However, in this case, we will use these settings to clearly demonstrate the distorting effects of JPEG's lossy compression. Click the Export button to export the image. Navigate to the File menu and select Close All. If prompted, click Discard Changes. Now let's compare the images that we just created. Go to the File menu and select Open. Select XCF version.xcf and click Open. Go again to the File menu and select Open. Select 
tiff version tiff and click open. Go to the file menu and click open. Select PNG version .png and click the open button. Finally, go to the file menu and click open. Select JPEG version .jpeg and click open. Now, let's compare these different versions of the image. At the center top of the GIMP workspace, there are multiple tabs, one for each of the files we opened. Each tab has a small thumbnail of the image it contains. Click on the thumbnail of the leftmost tab. This is the XCF file. Go to the Image menu and select Image Properties. We can see the XCF file's size here. Your file size may differ depending upon how you painted pixels in the image you created. However, the relative sizes between file types will be the focus as we compare file types. This XCF file contains all of the image data that we created. Click Close to close the Image Properties window. Then click the thumbnail of the image on the second tab from the left at the top of the GIMP workspace. This is the TIFF version. Again, click the Image menu and select Image Properties. In the Image Properties window that appears, we can see the TIFF's file size. Click the Close button to close the Image Properties window. Looking at the image in the workspace, we can see that the image looks the same in both the TIFF file and the XCF file. Click the thumbnail of the image on the third tab from the left. This is the PNG version of the image. Again, the PNG version of the image looks similar to the TIFF and XCF versions of the image. Go to the Image menu and select Image Properties. We can see the file size for the PNG file. Click the Close button to close the Image Properties window. Finally, click the thumbnail of the image on the rightmost tab at the top of the GIMP workspace. If we look closely at the image in the GIMP workspace, we can see that there is a lot of distortion around the edges of the pixels that we painted. This distortion is an artifact of the JPEG compression we used when saving the file. Go to the Image menu and select Image Properties. Looking at the file size, we can see that the JPEG is the smallest of all four files. Click the Close button to close the Image Properties window. So when working with images in GIMP, it is good to use the XCF file type to preserve all of the image data and other information that can be important for future editing of the image. Because the TIFF file format uses lossless compression, it does retain the full quality of 8-bit per channel RGB images. TIFF can also store higher bit depth image data, which is useful, for example, for storing microscopy images. When moving bitmap image data to other programs, PNG can be a useful file type since it will preserve all of the image information for 8-bit per channel RGB images and it uses efficient lossless compression which reduces file size while preserving image data. Notice that the PNG lossless compression is better able to reduce file size versus the TIFF's LZW compression. Finally, JPEG is not a good file format to use. JPEG can greatly reduce file size, but its lossy compression can also distort image data. In general, we want to use one of three file types when storing bitmap image data. For high bit depth images that will be moved between programs, we want to use TIFF. For bitmap images that we will edit in GIMP in the future, for example when saving incomplete bitmap editing work, we want to use GIMP's native XCF file type. And finally, for 8-bit per channel RGB bitmap images, 
that will be opened in other programs, we could use PNG because it reduces file size with lossless compression but does not compromise image quality. To close all the open images in GIMP, go to the File menu and select Close All. We can now quit GIMP and take a look at the OpenOfficeDraw program. OpenOfficeDraw is especially useful for creating and editing vector graphic images. For this workshop, we will be using Apache OpenOffice 4.0.1. There may be a newer version of Apache OpenOffice available now. In that case, please use the latest version of Apache OpenOffice that is available. Most of the tools and concepts covered in this workshop should be consistent across versions of OpenOffice Draw. When first launching OpenOffice, the program may display a menu allowing you to select a text document, spreadsheet, presentation, drawing, or other file type. In this case, please select Drawing to open OpenOffice Draw. If another program in the OpenOffice suite is open, start OpenOffice Draw by going to the File menu, selecting New, then selecting Drawing. This is the main OpenOffice Draw window. In the center of the window is the main OpenOffice Draw workspace. On the right side of the window is the sidebar. By default, the sidebar displays properties for the object or objects that are selected in the main OpenOffice Draw workspace. On the left side of the window, the Pages pane provides an overview of all the pages in the OpenOffice Draw file. We won't be using the Pages pane for this workshop, so move the mouse cursor over the X in the upper right corner of the Pages pane and click to close the pane. This will give us more screen real estate for the workspace. At the bottom of the OpenOffice Draw window is the main drawing toolbar. The leftmost tool in the drawing toolbar is the selection tool, which should be active now. Let's get started by drawing different shapes. Click on the ellipse tool in the drawing toolbar, then move the mouse cursor over the main workspace area. Click with the mouse button and drag to draw an ellipse. Continue to hold the mouse and drag to change the shape of the ellipse. Many OpenOffice Draw tools work with modifier keys. Hold down the Shift key while dragging with the mouse to constrain the proportions of the ellipse to a circle. Release the mouse button to draw a circle, then release the Shift button. Notice that the Selection tool automatically becomes active on the left side of the Drawing toolbar at the bottom of the screen. The circle that we've just drawn is a vector object. It is stored on the computer as a circular shape with a particular radius centered at a particular location in the workspace. It is not stored on the computer as a group of pixels. To see this, move the mouse to the lower right corner of the open office draw window. In this corner, there is a control to zoom in or out on the workspace. Click on the dot in the middle of this control and slowly drag it with the mouse to the right towards the circumscribed plus sign to zoom in. Release the mouse button, then pan around the workspace using the scroll bars at the bottom and on the right side of the workspace. Continue panning and zooming until zoomed all the way into 2,999%, with a portion of the curved edge of the circle visible in the workspace. Notice that the circumference of the circle remains smooth regardless of the zoom level. This is because the circle is stored as a vector and can be redrawn on screen at any zoom level or size desired. It is not composed of a fixed number of pixels like a circle in a bitmap image would be. In the middle of the zoom bar in the lower right corner of the window, there are two vertical hash marks. Click the leftmost hash mark to zoom to fit the full page on screen. Let's draw another shape. Click on the Rectangle tool in the Drawing toolbar at the bottom of the screen, then move the mouse cursor over an empty area of the page in the workspace and click and drag with the mouse to create a rectangle. Release the mouse button to draw a rectangle. Notice that the rectangle we just drew is surrounded by eight green rounded boxes. These are called handles. 
Move the mouse over a handle at one of the corners of the rectangle. The mouse cursor changes to a double arrow. Click and drag with the mouse to resize the rectangle, then release the mouse to set the new rectangle size. Move the mouse cursor over the center of the rectangle. The mouse cursor changes to a hand. Click and drag with the mouse to move the rectangle around the workspace. Release the mouse to place the rectangle at its new location. Click on an empty area in the workspace to deselect everything. Notice that the handles around the rectangle disappear, indicating that it is not selected. Move the mouse cursor over the center of the rectangle and single click to select the rectangle. Notice that the green resize handles appear around the rectangle. Click with the mouse again when over the center of the selected rectangle and notice that the green handles change to red circles. These handles can be used to shear and rotate objects. Move the mouse cursor over the red handle in the center of the top edge of the rectangle. Notice that the mouse cursor changes to a double arrow icon. Click and drag with the mouse to shear the rectangle. Release the mouse button to transform it into a rhomboid. It's possible to undo and redo actions. Go to the Edit menu, then select Undo to set the shape back to a rectangle. Then go back to the Edit menu and select Redo to set it back to a rhomboid. Now let's try rotating the rhomboid. Move the mouse cursor over the upper right red circle around the rhomboid. This and the other red corner handles are rotation handles. Notice that the mouse cursor changes to a semicircular double arrow shape. Click and drag with the mouse to rotate the rhomboid. Notice that there is a small black crosshair icon over the rhomboid and that this serves as the pivot point for the rotation. Release the mouse to set the rotation. Now let's change the pivot point for the rhomboid. Move the mouse cursor over the crosshair shape and notice that the mouse cursor changes to a pointing hand icon. Click and drag with the mouse to move the pivot point. Move the pivot point below and to the right of the rhomboid, then release the mouse to set the pivot point. Move the mouse cursor over one of the corner rotation handles around the rhomboid and notice that the mouse cursor changes to a semicircular double arrow shape. Click and drag with the mouse to rotate the rhomboid and notice that this time the rhomboid rotates around the new pivot point. Release the mouse to set the rotation. Because these shapes are vector graphic objects, we can resize and rotate them as needed. We can also change object colors. Click on an empty area of the workspace to deselect everything. Then single click on the circle. On the right side of the window, in the sidebar, some of the properties for the circle are shown. Under the fill section of the area properties in the sidebar, click on the bucket pull down menu. Then select green to fill the circle with green. Notice that there is still a gray line around the circumference of the circle. This line is sometimes called the outline or stroke of a vector graphics object. We'll refer to it as a line or outline in this workshop. Click the pull down menu under width in the line properties of the sidebar. Choose 6.0 points from the pull down menu and notice that the line width increases around the circumference of the circle. Now move the mouse cursor over the center of the circle and click and drag to move the circle. Move the circle so that it overlaps part of the rhomboid shape and release the mouse button to set its new location. Notice that the circle appears behind the rhomboid. 
Vector objects can be arranged so that some objects overlap other objects. To change the arrangement of the circle, with the circle still selected, go to the Modify menu and select Arrange, then Bring to Front. The circle moves in front of the rhomboid. Now click with the mouse on an empty area of the workspace to deselect everything. Move the mouse cursor to an area where the circle is overlapping the rhomboid, and single click. Notice that the circle is selected. Suppose, however, that we wanted to select the rhomboid, which is behind the circle. To do this, hold down the Alt key on the keyboard, and click again in the same location, and the rhomboid will be selected. When multiple objects are overlapping each other, hold Alt on the keyboard and click the overlapping area to cycle through selecting each of the overlapping objects in the arrangement. To select multiple objects, make sure the selection tool is active in the drawing toolbar at the bottom of the screen and hold down the Shift key. While holding down the Shift key, click on the circle to add it to the selection. The rhomboid and the circle should now both be selected. If they aren't both selected, continue holding the Shift key and click the unselected object to select it. It's possible to group multiple selected objects to more easily manipulate them. With both the rhomboid and the circle selected, navigate to the Modify menu and select Group to group the objects. Click with the mouse on an empty area of the workspace. Move the mouse cursor over one of the objects in the group and single click to select the group. Click and drag with the mouse and the grouped objects will move together. Then release the mouse button to set the new position for the group. Move the mouse over one of the corner handles around the group. Click and drag with the mouse to resize the group. Hold the shift key to constrain the proportions of the group to scale uniformly as the group is resized. Release the mouse button to set the new size of the group, then release the Shift key. To ungroup these objects, click the Modify menu and select Ungroup. Click on an empty area of the workspace to deselect everything. Then click and drag on the circle to move the circle so that it does not overlap the rhomboid. Release the mouse button to place the circle at its new location. With the circle still selected, click on one of the corner handles and drag the mouse to scale the circle. Note that as the circle scales, the width of the circle's outline remains the same. Release the mouse button to resize the circle. Then go to the Edit menu and select Undo to set the circle back to its previous size. It is often important for objects' lines to remain at a fixed width when the objects are resized. If objects' lines' widths shrank as objects were resized, the lines might become too thin to be visible when the objects became small, or they could be too thick when the objects were large. However, there are times when we might want to scale the width of an object's outline as we resize the object. To do this, the line itself must be converted to a shape that can be resized and edited. In OpenOffice Draw, shapes whose geometry can be closely edited are called contours. Let's convert the circle and its line to contours to enable more advanced editing. With the circle selected, go to the Modify menu and select Convert, then to Contour. Move the mouse cursor over one of the corner handles around the circle and click and drag to resize the circle. Hold the Shift key down to uniformly scale the circle and continue dragging with the mouse. Notice that now the width of the gray circumference of the circle scales as we resize the circle. This is because we have converted the line around the circumference of the circle to a contour. Release the mouse button to set the new size for the contours. Because the circle had both a fill and a line before it was converted to contours, there are now two contours that are grouped together. 
One contour is the shape of the outline around the circle, and the other is the circular shape of the fill of the circle. To ungroup these two contours, go to the Modify menu and select Ungroup. Click with the mouse on an empty area of the workspace to deselect everything. Then click and drag on the outline contour to move the circumference contour away from the filled circle contour. Because the circumference is now a contour, we can perform detailed editing of its shape. In the drawing toolbar at the bottom of the window, click on the points tool. Several new control points appear around the contour and the edit points toolbar should appear floating over the window. Zoom and pan the workspace to focus on a group of control points around the contour. Move the mouse cursor over one of the control points and notice that the mouse cursor changes to a white icon with a square to its lower right, indicating that the cursor is over a control point. Click and drag with the mouse and the control point will move, changing the shape of the contour. Release the mouse button to set the new location of the control point. Control points have a location through which the curve they control passes. They can also have tangents which control the shape and direction of the curves that pass through them. Looking closely at the control point we just modified, the control point itself is highlighted in blue since it was just moved and to either side of it there are two circular handles for the control point's tangents. Move the mouse cursor over one of the tangent handles. The mouse cursor changes with curved shapes to its lower right, indicating that it is over a tangent handle. Click and drag with the mouse to move the tangent handle. Notice that a symmetrical tangent on the opposite side of the control point moves in the opposite direction from the tangent handle we are moving. This is because the tangents for this control point are set to define a symmetric transition of the curve through the control point. As we drag the tangent handle, the direction from the control point to the tangent handle determines the direction that the curve is pulled by the tangent, and the distance from the control point to the tangent handle, which is also known as the magnitude of the tangent, determines how much the curve is pulled in that direction. Release the mouse button to set the tangent's new sizes and locations. A control point with a symmetric transition preserves the smoothness or continuity of the curve that passes through it. Sometimes we want to create sharp changes in the direction of a curve, for example when defining a corner. We can do this by changing a control point to define a corner point instead of a smooth transition. With the control point still selected, move the mouse cursor over the corner point tool on the edit point toolbar, then click the corner point tool. Notice that the tangents for the control point snap to point directly towards the previous and following control points on the contour. We can now move the tangent handles independently to change the shape of the curve on one side of the control point independently. Move the mouse cursor over one of the tangent handles, click and drag with the mouse to move the tangent and change the curve shape. Notice that the shape of the curve on the other side of the control point does not change. We will work more with editing contours in future sessions. Click the Points tool on the Drawing toolbar at the bottom of the window and notice that the control points disappear and the resize handles appear around the contour. Click and drag one of the resize handles to resize the whole contour, then release the mouse button to set its new size. Let's save our vector graphic. Go to the File menu and select Save As. In the Save window that appears, select a location to save the file, then enter the name First Vector, noting that this file will be saved with a .odg extension, then save the file. Go to the File menu and select Close. To open the file later, double-click on the file in the computer's file browser, or in Open Office, go to the File menu and select Open Document, then locate the first vector.odg file and open it. With that, we'll wrap up Session 1. For more information, including Sessions 2 and 3 of this workshop, please visit www.pdonk.com. 
go to the support section, then go to the figure preparation and image editing workshop link. I want to thank my colleague Jonathan Huppy for all his help and thank you very much for watching. I'm Curtis Glavin from the Pediatric Oncology Department at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute.